everyone. Welcome to PayPod. I'm your host, Jacob Hollibaugh. And today on the show, we're diving into the world of API security. With every passing episode of PayPod, we discuss, you know, the latest and greatest innovations, new products and services bursting onto the fintech scene, all of which typically boast their own API that we end up talking about and leads to the ever-growing web of APIs and tech stacks that make up modern enterprise companies. One thing we don't get to discuss nearly as often is keeping all those many APIs in your entire tech stack organized, in use, and most importantly, secure. So today, we're going to do just that, and I've got just the right guest to walk us through it all. I'm pleased to be joined by Richard Bird, Chief Security Officer at Traceable AI, the industry-leading API security company that helps organizations achieve API visibility and attack protection. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Very glad to be here. I didn't realize going in that AI and API would be kind of tough to say next to each other and to not you know, know when to throw that third letter in or not, but it's wonderful to have you. And as I mentioned there in the intro, APIs get talked about all the time on the show. Every, every single episode, whoever we're talking with, eventually we get down to the nitty gritty in the tech and talking about their APIs and their integrations and everything else. API security, however, doesn't typically get much mention on this show. So if you'd be so kind for me and the listeners who may be less familiar with this idea, could you explain the basics of what API security even means and what the kind of purpose or driving benefit of it is? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before I kind of reel that out a little bit, I mean, I'll, I'll share. I'm actually very excited to be on this podcast. Uh, the reason is, is that um, as a technologist, I was born and raised in fintech. Uh, in the in the middle 90s, I started with a company uh, called CheckFree uh, back in the day uh, that really pioneered point to point, person to person payments. Um, and here I am back wow. uh, Back in the fold. Um, well, that you started then the right spot because we it comes up often on this show. The show is slowly but surely might might as well be a cybersecurity show because the world of fintech and technology in general is so you know that is maybe the most important thing around all of it so those worlds blended and it's cool to hear you started in one kind of we're always within the blend of these two worlds the whole time yeah yeah that that led me into a path into banking proper where i worked for many many years so i'm uh, solutions i worked 20 plus years in the in the enterprise that's relevant to the API conversation and how API security works for very specific reasons. The first is, is that if we think about the history of application programming interfaces, the API space, mm -hmm. um, it is a space that for now closing in on 15 years um, has never been managed, has never been um, run from a pure operational standpoint like all other aspects of technology stacks. APIs were uh, opportunities for developers to hook into assets and resources uh, that they needed, and and it has un unleashed massive business value. Right? Um, I saw a survey the other day that showed that somewhere between seventy two and seventy five percent of all daily uh, internet traffic are, are APIs. Um, that's massive, right? That is an enormous amount of traffic. Much of it tied to personal information. Uh, economic transactions, whether they're monetary, crypto, um, you know, large, uh, you know, treasury transfers. This is all now happening on the public internet. A decade ago, we would have been like, that's never going to happen. Uh, we're not going to put that stuff out on the public internet. We do it all the time now, and we do it using APIs. But because we've had very little control in the structure, classification, management, deployment, like most companies don't even have have a change control process around APIs that are already in production. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that lack of controls that have been applied from a security standpoint and all other aspects of the technology stack, um, APIs represent the largest unmitigated attack surface every company has today. And if you ask somebody, how many APIs do I have? What do those APIs reside? What are those APIs doing? Um, more times than not, you're going to get back blank stares. Right. And no time in security history, now I'll put my security hat on, no time in security history has the answer I don't know to <laughs> anything been safe, right, or secure. 
Um, and we go through these discovery phases about every decade. How many virtual machines do I have? How many uh, you know accounts and credentials do I have? And now how many APIs do I have? So API security is really about continuous monitoring of APIs, what they're doing, how they're behaving, um, what they're supposed to be doing, where they're supposed to be going. Great thing about an API, APIs are always built where the design spec itself is already present. It's in the code. We know what it's supposed to do. We know what endpoints it's supposed to go to, what it's allowed to transact and not allowed to transact. Um, but security, a security wrapper around all that means that we're continuously monitoring to make sure that an API is doing what it was designed to do, delivering what it was designed to deliver, and being leveraged by systems or people that it was designed to be leveraged uh, for. Um, and and right now, the, a lot of what I just went through are absolute blind spots to most uh, companies and organizations. So API security encompasses not just testing in the AppSec space, but runtime protection, catalog and discovery, risk and posture management. You know, really has turned into a very extensive and expansive set of capabilities in order to be able to do uh, what you need to with APIs. Yeah. And so you referenced there, you know, it's only been 15 years, I think you said, since, you know, the onset of this technology in general, and that there was a point even 10 years ago where what we, how we operate today, people would have laughed at and said, no way, we would never do that. Was there any sort of tipping point over the last half decade or decade that like all of that changed, that sentiment changed, or where things kind of picked up more rapidly? When when did the idea, I guess, basically of like, we're going to need someone to monitor all, monitor all of this actually kind of first come about? I, I think there are a couple of different um, really important pieces or landmarks uh, in history that, that bring us to this point of, of massive API volume with very little understanding of uh, the risk of those APIs. Um, and, and I think it's really important, like 1955, I think it was, uh, some researchers wrote uh, a paper about a theoretical notion called application pro uh, programming interfaces, right? APIs have been an understood quantity for 50, 60 years now. Um, they were very difficult to use back in my old days running data centers and monolithic applications because most monolithic applications back in the day were written in very proprietary code right mm -hmm. so landmark number one is the rise of of open source and open standards mm -hmm. uh you know whether that be at the language level whether it be at the protocol level whether it, you just kind of name them right open source and open standards um created a much more integration friendly environment mm -hmm. and then once we moved uh you know our activities to the cloud with massive you know efforts around cloud mi migration and as well as you know just pure native web application building in the SaaS space and all of that um we ended up putting you know all of these applications exposing them directly to the world wide web directly to http and https and um and because we're exposing all of that outside of our boundaries then we start to lose substantial amounts of security control capabilities. Um, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, a little bit as it relates to payments. But you know, the payments world has always been a model for um, tr transactional flow, in that there's always a requester and a responder, or a payer and a payee. You know, there are two points at the ends of these transactions, very similar to the way that APIs work. Um, they typically work on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, you know, with a requester and a responder. And the real problem is, is that um, because nobody owns the internet, <laughs> um, once that transaction leaves my endpoint, in the interim, in that space in between, there are a lot of questions about who owns the security for that. Now, the argument becomes, well, it's got encryption. Well, you know what? I've been in security for a long time. How well is encryption working for us historically? Not great, right? And the receiver is saying, hey, I'm just receiving what's getting to me. I don't have any obligations for security for that. So we have this really interesting um, set of cognitive dissonances, I like to call them, big gaps um, in, in both thinking as well as risk and control management around APIs because they were always just code widgets. Nobody cared. You know, you mean you can get my application in production faster? Cool. You mean that it, I'd always love the Twilio example. I've used this Twilio example a number of times. I think it was 08 or 09. Twilio built an entire business case for their, their funding off of one slide that says, um, I can get all the information about you that I need to with five APIs. 
And then they would run that demo and the investors' minds were blown. They were like, oh my gosh, you got all this information about me from all these different sources that apparently weren't protected. And then, you know, you have this profile of me. Where do I write the check for Twilio, right? This is kind of the, the rush to greatness that we've seen. Now, there's one last element that I think is important. COVID saw a massive blow up in APIs. And the reason is, is because um, developers uh, were, were distanced from each other. There was a lot, a lot of fragmentation in terms of remote working that made it very, very difficult for people to do, you know, long sessions to build inter integration hooks and all that kind of stuff. So they started using APIs at really massive scale. And so that's why we saw a huge explosion from about 2019 to current. And then when we look at things like Kong, uh, you know, has put out an analysis recently with a world economist um, saying that attacks against APIs are going to grow by a thousand percent, successful attacks by a thousand percent by the 2030. Um, but that the volume of APIs are probably going to, uh, you know, escalate by 100, 600, 700 percent in that same time period. So now you can just kind of get this vision of a runaway freight train. Like we're not doing much in the way of security. We're putting more into the system. We're having less and less uh, visibility into what is getting thrown into the internet. And that doesn't even start to bring into the uh, conversation things like supply chain risk, third party risk, who are also using APIs. They're not connecting with you with APIs. And on top of that, your developers are now using APIs to connect, connect internal systems because it's asked and it delivers value. And yet there's very little in the way of notional security around these subjects. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So we've danced around it a little bit. That was a fantastic overview and I appreciate you going through it for those of us who are less familiar with it. Really, really well said. And so Traceable AI company you work with is obviously tackling this this entire problem that we've been laying out here. Could you tell me a little about you know who Traceable is, what exactly the product or service offering is, and who you most commonly work with? Yeah, yeah, I I I, um, I love talking about Traceable, <laughs> and I'm not the founder. Um, <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it is important to talk about our, our genetic roots. Um, our founders uh, are uh, Jyoti Bansal and Sanjay Nagaraj. Jyoti is um, is famous in the technology world, not uh, because of Traceable, um, but because uh, he built and eventually uh, sold to Cisco AppDynamics. Mm. Um, and AppDynamics was a very, it is still a very widely used uh, application performance uh, management system um, that had huge impacts on improving uh, our all of our experiences in the inter internet. Um, but, uh, you know, the company actually uh, came, there, there's a mythology about the company, uh, came to, to be because um, all the performance metrics for those applications um, were being, uh, you know, aggregated, and all of the security-related information from those same calls was being basically tossed on the floor. And one of our solutions engineers at one time said, hey, do you think anybody cares about the security stuff? And there you go. Here comes Traceable. Um, and Traceable has the unfair advantage. I always like to say we're the most unfairly advantaged round B startup in history uh, because our founder obviously was very, very successful with his first exit. He has another company, Harness, which is a, a CICD pipeline company. And then he has Traceable. And uh, all three companies have, have been wildly successful. Now, with Traceable, um, as we developed into a security platform um, from those beginnings, we recognized there were a number of short-sighted positions in API security. The first is a lot of times you'll hear people in technology say, I don't have an API security problem because I have a WAF and I have a gateway. Hmm. Now, WAFs and gateways have been around for a long time. Um, the amount of security that is provided by gateways is somewhere between zero and none um, <laughs> because they're routers, right? They, they manage to the language of the APIs and they send APIs where they're supposed to go. Web application firewalls are basically boundary guardians, right? They allow or pro prohibit or, you know, any traffic that comes in based on rules or other policy triggers, um, you're able to kind of take care of bad things that you know about. And now begins the problem, what Traceable really excels at. Mm -hmm. um, the It's the behaviors of the APIs that are indicators of their risk and their threat, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that um, bad actors are learning how to use APIs for new breaches and new hacks every single day, which means there are no pu published vulnerabilities, no published exploits. Uh, it means that you know maybe some researchers are sitting around in a corner somewhere and discovering a couple of new exploits, 
Um, but but in the main, what's actually happening is a large number of attacks are unknown, unknown unknowns, right? And unless you're able to measure the behaviors of those APIs like Traceable can um, using our secure threat lake, um, every time, every single time an API is used, you cannot understand whether an API is being exploited or not. It's, right. it's virtually impossible. So, um, you know, Traceable's take has been, let's figure out how to protect all APIs everywhere. Internal, external, third party, vendor supplied, commercialized, monetized, doesn't really matter, all of them across the board. Um, how do we build the best in class uh, data collection capabilities to be able to collect that traffic? That's some really technical magic stuff. Um, you know, that's something we, you know, we deep dive in with people because we're talking about Linux kernel layer level. We're talking about, you know, VPC mirroring, stuff that, you know, can get really, really tricky, but we've mastered all of that. We collect that traffic. We have an ongoing catalog of APIs, you know, tons and tons of APIs and everybody's environment that's listening have been built with no documentation. Um, that is a consistent team for the last 30 years of technology. <laughs> Build my code, no documentation. Yeah. Um, but we are actually able to auto generate documentation. Now we have a basis to do that normative baseline threat uh, analytics against. Here's what we know the API was designed to do, it's actually doing. And then we've got the triggers that are necessary to protect the company once something starts to go bad. So we can either do that by passing information to a policy enforcement point like a gateway or to uh, a web application firewall, or we can actually natively just shut it off. Um, most companies aren't ready for that second point that I made. Um, they're, they're, there's still a lot of resistance to uh, automation around uh, runtime protection and shutting down you know, anything um, because there's concerns of, of impact on those kind of things. But the reality is, is that we are moving into a world where runtime protection um, at the actual API execution layer uh, or execution level is going to be a necessity um, because uh, if you're just passing off a policy enforcement, you could have a time gap of minutes, if not more, and you the house could be cleaned out. Right, the the way that the way the way that the world is working with bad actors, uh, the speed that they operate at um, is faster than than human capabilities. We have to start relying on some automation. We pre-built those capabilities into Traceable. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned there, you know, that you do have a little pushback on kind of the secondary part of what you're hoping to continue doing for folks. I wonder, do you have, what's the initial response from most people? Is it like, oh my gosh, thank goodness someone is finally going to do this for us? Or is it more, you kind of referenced early on, like some people might say, we don't need, what, what do you mean? We've got, we've got this covered with this and this and do those really work? No, but we've got it covered. Uh, what is the kind of typical general reception of you coming in and saying, this is an, like, we're kind of creating this world because it clearly needs to be done and we're here to do it for you. Is it thank goodness, or is it more often like you got to explain yourselves and convince me? There's a, there's a half a dozen ways to answer that question. <laughs> um, I won't cover them all. Uh, okay. the, 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 the way that I'll split that today First, kind of reverting back to a year and a half ago when I started at Traceable, a um, lot of, of I don't mean this to be offensive, so nobody take it as an offense, but a lot of willful ignorance around APIs um, and the risk that they represent companies. Similar to that, I've got a gateway and I've got a WAF, no big deal, mm -hmm. right? Um, I've got it covered. And, um, and, and one of the things, like if you go look at the headline news of the last 18 months, it's been very helpful to me in having this conversation about whether API security is not important or not because of the level and scale and the damage that the breaches have, have created, um, you know, in the marketplace, right? The, you know, one single uh, API uh, with one exposed endpoint netted to 37 million lost accounts by T-Mobile. That's huge. And I think I've seen the figures that the recovery on that's been something like $150 million. So I would say in the 18 months since I've started, there's been a recognition in the marketplace uh, across all verticals um, that API security is a thing, um, that those companies that were breached and were in the headline news, they all had a WAF and they all had a gateway. So what went wrong, right? What, what happened that that wasn't sufficient from a security standpoint? And so those are thoughts and ideas are starting to propagate. Now there's a second part of the answer that I think is really relevant to the audience for uh, for this discussion, which is where we have seen a massive uh, change 
in attitude and and concern is in banking, financial services, and fintech. And the reason for that um, is, first of all, it's money. Um, and when we think about the condition of how bad APIs have been uh, from an exploitability standpoint, um, there have been you know several breaches where uh, there have been you know monetary takeouts associated. API hacks. Um, fraud in particular is super interesting. It's capitalizing on that 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 gap where nobody is owning the security while it rides on the internet. We're seeing the beyond the edge uh, uh, kind of fraud happening on a re regular basis, um, you, you know, in customers and and use cases and, and scenarios where we're providing protection already. Um, so back Banks have the most lucrative, you know, treasure, um, which is why banks are super interested in mitigating the, ri the risk. But that's not the only thing that's driving banking, fintech, and, and financial services. Um, it's regulatory and compliance. Uh, the OCC uh, has been very specific about APIs in one standard so far. Uh, the FFIEC put out a mandate uh, two years ago now for full catalog discovery, understanding, inventory of all of your APIs as well as a risk assessment against those APIs. Um, it caught a lot of banks short uh, because it was embedded in a standard that really didn't make any sense for that standard to have, um, and they missed it. And so you saw a lot of scrambling of banks to get observability first. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but as the bankers have looked at and and like I said, FinTech and financial services writ large, as they've looked at the problem, they go, oh, this risk is huge. We we didn't put two and two together. We understood that we had opportunities for exploit, but we didn't realize how big the attack surface was. Um, you know, cases where companies have, particularly in banking, financial services, and fintech, they have 10, 50, 60, 100,000 API, uh, APIs operating in their environments. Um, that's a huge amount of traffic to try and monitor and keep secure. And so uh, definitely a lot of movement and recognition in the banking, financial service, fintech. And then a lot of um, a lot of recognizing the size and scale of the problem outside of uh, that particular set of industrial or verticals, but but still a lot of resistance because um, the reality is is that companies have put a ton of money into their entrenched security stacks. Um, now, the idea of repurposing funding or finding new dollars to cover a completely new frontier for them, um, it, it takes them a lot of work to move their companies and get them thinking in the direction of protecting what, you know, what's commonly known as the layer seven. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing a lot of that kind of, uh, I know I need to do something, I don't know what to do, but I haven't still allocated any budget or have a, a program yet. Yeah, it's always that tricky part that comes in the world of security of like, we maybe should be priority number one for all of your companies, but when it comes to allocating the budget, somehow we always end up priority four, five, six, and suddenly there isn't as much left to uh, actually give or spend or, you know, put yep. put into use, uh, which is uh, all too unfortunate. But, you know, one day, one day we'll get there and those things will level out, hopefully. <laughs> well, I, think um, there's a helpful, I think there's a real quick helpful story there yep. for, for the audience. Um, um, which is these changes come in about 10 year waves, at least in my experience, right? And as these changes come, we have ourselves oriented to the way that we do security today. And then something new comes along and we go, well, no, I'm going here. And then 10 years on, we're proven to have been wrong and made the wrong decision. And a great example of that, you know, where I'm at today with folks when we talk about API security, whether they have it or not, is Okay, if your API security is dependent upon, say, WAFs and gateways, and you're not using an API security platform like Traceable, let me ask you a question. In 2014, you have a choice to make. In 2014, you can buy Symantec AVG, or you can buy endpoint security from a three-year-old company named CrowdStrike. Which one do you buy? And people People always go, well, I'm going to buy CrowdStrike. And I'm like, no, 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 this isn't a cool kids conversation, right? This is 2014. And they go, yeah, I'm probably buying Symantec AVG. I'm like, 10 years on, right choice? Three years after 2014, right choice? People go, mm, no. And I'm like, so expand your mind a little bit. Be intellectually curious and say, where's the ball going, right? And if the ball is going in a direction that's not consistent with 
how we're able to secure and control those technologies today, you better be looking at what's coming, you know, in that in that ten year horizon. Um, and that's that's exactly why I joined Traceable. I'm like, this is where the ball's going, and uh, and we've got an opportunity to be ahead of it, uh, but we still have to get through all of the you know the cultural and historical resistances, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great analogy too, and that makes makes perfect sense of how how we should be allocating our not just our money but our attention and our focus on what what we need to be working on. You started walking through you know some parts of this specific to the fintech industry other than anything you already kind of covered is there anything unique or different compared to other industries when trying to secure APIs within the world of fintech and financial is it just simply that quantity like you said being you know really really is that way bigger than other places would be is there anything that makes this industry unique to try to secure yeah i you know it, it'll be unique unique by degrees is what i'm going to say might apply to other verticals like aerospace would be a great example right um you know because really what we're talking about is criticality right what what is the criticality of a function of that api from a transactional standpoint um so when we're talking about money when we're talking about you know uh, national monetary infrastructures and currency exchanges and international clearing and all these kind of things um, these are all very important usually very complicated um, transactions uh, at least in all of the work that it takes for these things to reach a point where an api is triggered to move money someplace um, and so i don't think it's just i don't think it's just volume volume itself um, yes enormous criticality and when we talk about this you know landscape of money and all the different ways that money is transacted um the complicated nature of that network as well as the demands of that network for um you know zero failure right are enormous and i think that that is um a, a big critical differentiator for financial services fintech and banking now i think the other thing that is really important to understand i had a really funny conversation a couple of days ago um pci dss4 right has a lot of changes mm -hmm. um actually some of the most interesting prescriptive changes that i've seen and I, and I will tell the audience like from a regulatory standpoint in the api space what we are seeing and what is coming i can put my hand on the table and tell you this uh, what we're seeing and we are, are and what's coming is prescriptive no more of this. This is the expected outcome in the regulation. We don't care how you achieve that outcome as long as you can prove the controls work. We are seeing the feds moving to a, you need to know all of your APIs. Mm -hmm. Do you mean edge APIs? All of your APIs. Yeah. Do you mean internal APIs and edge APIs? All of your APIs, right? Um, I've had several people in the banking industry who've said that the OCC examiners have been really tough this year. And when the FinTech and FinServe side, when we talk about the differences and, and the importance of API security, understand that the CFPB's movements relative to di digital consumer trust and open banking are going to have a knock-on effect. Many of the folks that are, you know, your listeners are currently operating in a light touch regulatory way. Uh, CFPB is proposing that, um, you know, a substantial number of companies will have to abide by banking regulations, even though they're not a bank. So this landscape change is another big, big difference. But PCI DSS4, um, back to the prescriptive nature of it, um, one of the things that is out there is a annual sampling or assessment is no longer enough. You have to have prove that you have continuous security monitoring. Mm -hmm. So in a conversation with somebody the other day, they said, well, you know, I, I think you're overstating the issue because um, I read PCI DSS4 and it doesn't say a single thing about PIs. And you're right. If you did a you know control F search in the document for PCI DSS4 and said API, you won't find a single one. My response was name me a credit card transaction that doesn't run with an API today. Yeah. And the light bulb goes on. <laughs> right. All of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, you're right. That stuff does all right over the internet anymore. Nobody has point-to-point, -point, you know, connections. Nobody's got, you know, dial-ins to each other anymore. Um, so they all ride on APIs. And this is, I, I think this is the foundational truth about banking, financial services, and fintech. You are in an API world every single day. 
And uh, API security isn't a nice to have at all. Um, it is an absolute necessity to be successful. I'm not the only one that thinks that way. If you look at what is happening with Swift, Swift is is, is eliminating itself. Um, I'm an old hedge fund uh, administration guy in technology, and I was shocked. Like Swift is actively working for its own extinction by building ISO 222, which does specifically reference APIs. Um, and FSISAC has built the FDX API. Like this is the way that the entire world is going. And this gets back to the point that I made, right? If you can see these indicators of where the ball is going, waiting another two years, waiting another year to begin to seriously get to work on API security is going to put you so far behind that you are going to be, you know, the weak and sickly animal in the herd that those bad actors are going to come after super, super hard. Yeah. And even if you manage to continue existing for the next cycle to complete, you're going to struggle even more the next time around to see the ball and actually follow it even again the next time, even if you get the chance to do so. So that's all all really good logic. The final thing that kind of leads me to is potentially that that cycle we've talked about and uh, kind of the different iterations and waves maybe quickening, which is the second part of the name, Traceable AI. I feel like I need to ask you a little bit about the AI part of that name and AI's role in all of this, because it will be a large role. Um, you know, you'll be able to say here what type of role and how large, but I can, I, even the my naive self can say, it's gonna be a big one for sure. So uh, why is AI in the name? You know, what are, how are you using it now to kind of build the platform or operate the platform in? How does the proliferation of AI tech affect what you do, the entire you know tech stack ecosystem, API ecosystem? And would I be, you know, I'm someone who thinks, you know, things are only accelerating at bigger and bigger factors. So when you referenced earlier, you know, this 10 year cycle, to me, I think add AI into the equation, that 10 year cycle, the next one might be eight, the one after that might be five, the one after that might be three, et cetera. Uh, I just threw a lot at you and I think there was a few questions in there, but explain the use of AI in the name and the company and yeah. what you think it's gonna, how you think it's gonna affect this world. Yeah, AI, you know, now, let me let me first give the cynical answer. I am an old crusty technologist and I've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not new, and we, we yeah. I, I really wish the media would stop suggesting that it is. Um, you know, it's super fascinating what you can do with a ton of NVIDIA, you know, cards and, you know, a large language model. Um, but when it comes to the realities of how companies are using AI, LLM is a distraction, right? Um, that, that may not be the case for people that are running call centers and all that kind of stuff, but if you're building solutions, if you're building software, basically, um, you, you're looking at AI and, and why it's such an important part, component of Traceable. You're looking at AI to optimize your capabilities from an operational perspective, right? Um, so things like LAM and L uh, LLMs, right? Computational or automation uh, AI are very, very important to us, very much a part of our built-in componentry. And the reason is, is because um, Today, I can't, I don't even want to think about this 10 years from now, but today um, we're currently monitoring trillions of calls a year, trillions. And in trillions, we're trying to find the eye within the eye within the eye within the eye of the needle in the haystack, yeah. right? And this comparative analytics uh, piece, right? Um, and, and there's no human factor that is good enough. There's no amount of humans in terms of, you know, some total um, that would ever be enough to be able to catch what we're able to catch with our use of artificial intelligence um, in our platform. Um, the the speed and the capability of, you know, computation, computational or automation related AIs uh, allow us to be able to respond in application with no additional uh you know touch by a human by another system you know by some else some something else assessing you know the risk criticality the issue the problem um, so that's where we leverage ai and um, i always like to name drop um we're so serious about ai uh we uh last year uh, dr jisheng wang joined our team uh jisheng like I just encourage everyone just go ahead and do a quick Google. Um, he uh, he he's one of the original 
uh, patent creators and holders around the rise of uh, uh, UEBA uh, or you know end user behavioral analytics, um, which was really kind of the beginnings of of high value AI several years ago in in technology solutions. Uh, we have the guy that created it, um, and and his uh, I struggle sometimes to talk with him because he's way up here intellectually um and it kind of blows my mind but um the net effect that that both his work and the engineering teams that are associated with our ai uh, work have yielded for our customers and being able to identify those unknown unknowns or um the equivalent of a zero day in an api um has just been massive like we wouldn't we wouldn't be the success that we are today without leveraging ai capabilities yeah, absolutely. Well, Richard, this has been a real pleasure and definitely uh, super interesting and only scary at little bits of time, which is pretty good for talking about these topics. It can get scary sometimes pretty quickly. So for those listening who may want to learn more about Traceable AI or follow you, get in touch, where would be the best place for them to go to do so? Uh, so Traceable AI, uh, definitely traceable.ai. If you go to the website and get everything that you need um, from me, uh, you know, one of the things that I often, you know, make sure I round off a discussion with is, is I'm a resource to the market, whether it's, uh, you know, API security or identity security, which I'm extremely well known for, um, you know, or it's just making connections with somebody in the industry, or you just have a question, look up LinkedIn, um, hashtag the guy with the bow tie, uh, Richard Bird, B-I-R-D, super easy to find me. Um, and I'm I'm there. I, whether it's a traceable conversation or another conversation, if it's advancing, you know, making the digital world safer for everybody, um, I'm ready to have that talk. So look forward to catching up with people. Love that. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. We'll link to those and more in the show notes below. Richard, thank you so much for your time and knowledge today. I've greatly enjoyed it and hope to speak again sometime soon. Thank you. Totally appreciate it.